I'm Natalie Kenway, editor of ESG Clarity, and welcome to the Green Dream video series where we speak to members of the responsible investment industry. In this episode, I'm joined by Lisa Beauvillain, Executive Director and Head of Sustainability and ESG at Impacts. Thank you for the, taking the time to speak with me today, Lisa. Thanks for having me. First of all, can you explain what ESG means to Impacts? Well, I would say that uh, in its broader sense, ESG gives us an opportunity to make the best possible investment decisions with the uh, maximum of uh, relevant information going well beyond sort of financial accounts and providing the tools assessing companies both more broadly but also more deeply. Today, companies' value uh, is to a very large part dominated by intangible value. This could be intellectual property, but also, for example, human capital, training, culture, uh, which uh, are not really areas that we have good data on, for instance. And so we need to go well beyond data and well beyond financial accounts to really grasp that. And at Impact, we believe that the economy is in a transition away from depletive economic models and uh, uh, that don't take negative social and environmental costs into account. And we believe that these types of business models are and will be disrupted by, for example, more efficient solutions and technologies in the future and already now, uh, but also changes, for example, in consumer preferences. And we see this very clearly, for example, in the food industry. There's also societal factors. There's a lot of transparency today and uh, data and uh, information travels within seconds from one side of the planet to another. So it's very difficult for companies to sort of uh, be opaque on or, or hide uh, events, et cetera. But also, very importantly, regulations and policies are driving change today. And uh, we can see those, for example, within the net zero policies that are taking place in different countries. So with all that in mind, we invest in companies and assets that um, enable and benefit from a transition to a more sustainable economy. And so really understanding which companies and activities are well positioned will be increasingly important for successful investing going forward in our view. And so we use this sustainability thinking both in defining our investment universes, which companies are well positioned, but then also in analyzing our companies in detail um, at the sort of fundamental level, but also in how we engage with our companies on, on these topics. And finally, I would say that um, this ESG analysis and work at Impacts is fully integrated in the investment team. And we have uh, deliberately um, decided not to have a separate ESG team. We want to avoid information silos, and we do believe that uh, we can get most out of both the financial and ESG analysis if, uh, if these are conducted by the same analysts. Um, can you also explain the various strategies that you have at Impacts and what themes the investors can access? We invest in the opportunities arising from this transition that I mentioned to a more sustainable economy. And we do so across all main asset classes. But the bulk of our assets under management today are in listed equities. And so within listed equities, a significant part of our strategies are in thematic equities, which um, are strategies, for example, predominantly focused on environmental solutions in areas, for example, within what we would regard as broader environmental solution strategies which include, uh, for example, companies providing um, energy efficiency, renewable energy uh, solutions, and uh, water infrastructure, for instance, cir circular economy and sustainable food. And these strategies could be either global or they could be, for example, specific, specifically in Asia Pacific. But we also have strategies looking uh, very specifically at some of these uh, value chains, for example, within just water or sustainable food. So we have been investing in these environmental solutions for more than 20 years and have developed what we call the impacts environmental markets classification system. And it is really to define environmental markets and identify the companies that uh, we believe belong there. And those will have more than 20 or 50% of their revenues coming from these environmental solutions. Our thesis has always been for, for more than 20 years that these companies provide solutions to much needed environmental and often also health challenges, for example, in pollution control, and will have so-called tailwinds and, uh, and will experience higher growth and be good investments. And this, this has been the case <clears throat> to date. 
Um, but roughly seven or eight years ago, we recognized that there are definitely unmet needs beyond uh, the environmental ones. And we expanded to assess what enablers and solution providers look uh, like for a transition, for example, to more sustainable healthcare systems or access to finance and what does sustainability mean within technology. <clears throat> and as part of that, we, de we developed something we call the impact sustainability lens. And uh, the lens allows us to assess all economic activities and their risks and opportunities and prioritize those subsectors and activities that uh, have higher opportunities and lower risk. Again, the tailwinds, but a lower risk of being disrupted. And as part of those uh, sort of lens-related uh, strategies, we have both global and regional equity strategies uh, that are sort of following a more unconstrained approach to sustainability. And obviously we've had um, a very difficult year. How has um, COVID-19 impacted the funds and uh, has it made you think about a different approach maybe? I don't think I would say that we have uh, changed our approach, but I do think it's becoming increasingly clear, and I must say the pandemic has only strengthened that view, that investing in companies and activities that are very resilient and uh, that are well aligned again to this transition to a more sustainable economy will become even more important as we are likely to sort of continue to experience external shocks, whether they are acute um, as, as this one, as the pandemic is, or more chronic uh, type uh, external shocks, uh, for, for example, extreme weather and climate events, uh, and for example, more of these zoonotic virus outbreaks such as COVID-19, but also in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, we've seen you know, Ebola and swine flu and SARS, and it's really down to uh, uh, us, uh, you know, conducting and continuing to do deforestation and interference and destruction of ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, but also, I think what is quite worrisome and uh, one that uh, is sort of definitely bubbling under and uh, is not necessarily hugely focused on by, by the sort of uh, broader populations is the risk of uh, future ineffectiveness of our antibiotics. And this is due to uh, bacteria simply becoming increasingly resistant to the antibiotics we know today uh, due to their overuse, especially in farming. So uh, I think those are some of the uh, sort of uh, uh, risks there. I think I would also like to highlight the sort of uh, uh, corrosion of uh, trust in science and governments and institutions and even our health authorities today with a sort of uh, what you could almost call an epidemic of conspiracy theories and fake news on especially social media platforms, which leads to increasing divisions between people and countries and opinions and this comes at a, at a time when we actually desperately need to solve these major global challenges that I just spoke about, and that really require uh, more collaboration and, and global collaboration to be solved. So, you know, I wouldn't say our approach has changed with the pandemic, uh, rather just really confirm that the risks that may have seen a bit distant, either in space or time, can actually become very real very quickly and change our daily lives and have devastating effects on the uh, on the economy. So if we, if anything, we are even more focused than ever on considering what the investment solutions are to these challenges. Um, and I, I would just highlight maybe, of course, climate and carbon uh, mitigation and adaptation, whether it is around buildings and industrial energy efficiency, or perhaps more decentralized grid infrastructure, which is going to be key or within, again, biodiversity, where I think today the main opportunities are within, for example, software, satellites, or new food producing methods that are much less taxing on, on the environment and biodiversity. And I think within, finally, within healthcare, very interested in, for example, so-called contract research organizations or CROs, which are improving the efficiency of uh, drug discovery, which is very key today but also anything that would be preventive healthcare and diagnostics. So a few of those sort of uh, real focus areas for us today. Changed in the context of the coronavirus pandemic? So I would say um, in the shorter term, there has certainly been more questions than before about uh, staff health and uh, safety and their well-being and the way companies support uh, staff and employees, but also about supply chain resiliency and potential sort of diversification and 
actually localization of supply chains, which is quite an interesting phenomenon because having more localized supply chains could actually better enable a more circular economy of materials, for instance, than the very remote supply chain system that we have today. But I think the focus on and the sort of uh, uh, the magnitude of engagements around human capital and broader company stakeholders are definitely here to stay even after the pandemic. It's one of those uh, things I think that will stay in the same way as we probably will do. We'll do more uh, virtual and uh, um, virtual meetings and conferences in the future. But I think the big change in engagement has been the actual maturing of the whole practice of engagements of late. And I don't think it's really related to the pandemic per se. And really the sort of realization that it is very insufficient to keep on talking about and reporting how many engagements meetings investors have had, for example, but instead really focusing on the actual outcomes of engagements and results and ensuring that engagements are effective through, for example, the careful planning and prioritizing of engagement topics, but also setting very, very clear objectives and steps for the engagements and following through with these steps as well. But I also think it's important for us as investors and long-term uh, shareholders to really be a sort of partner in these engagements with companies and not just us dem demanding more information and progress, but providing uh, also from our perspective insights and uh, where appropriate advice to the companies. And so it is it's more of a sort of give and, give and take and more interactive because investors we, we, we do see a lot of companies on their journeys to developing robust sustainability risk management systems, for example, and reporting around that. And I think we can and we really should share these learnings and observations with the companies. And I think that's a, one of the sort of keys to successful engagement and something we all, all need to do more of. You touched on reporting there. What does the implementation of the EU taxonomy mean for reporting and disclosure in the responsible investment space? Yes. Um, well, it certainly does mean a lot of extra work, a lot of a um, lot more analysis and reporting. And it is, of course, time away from important work such as engagements and investment analysis, etc. There's no question about that. But of course, we are hopeful that the uh, taxonomy and the other almost simultaneous sustainable finance reporting requirements that uh, are taking place uh, at, the, at the time being as well, will improve the definitions and the transparency and the clarity of what really constitutes sustainability and, and green activities, for instance. And then also help allocate more capital to these economic areas that are really sort of truly solutions and, and uh, very much needed uh, areas of the economy. But having established and developed sorry, <coughs> environmental taxonomies for more than 20 years at impacts, here are probably the sort of challenges for the taxonomy as we see it. One thing is uh, how the taxonomy will stay dynamic over time. We are at impacts uh, considering continuously and all the time uh, what might be new technologies, what might uh, be new areas of the economy that uh, actually have become uh, or are no longer uh, an environmental solution, solution. And these are very fast moving and growing markets. So it really requires to be dynamic. So I think that's one question mark for us, how something that is uh, you know, led by um, a sort of uh, expert group uh, for the time being, how that's going to be staying dynamic and relevant over time. I think the sort of second element, and it, it, it is definitely slightly related, is that uh, one of our learnings and observations over the last 20 plus years of uh, looking at environmental solutions is that some of the best uh, investments within environmental markets and, um, and also, you know, incredibly often very critical components of uh, the environmental markets and value chains are actually not always so obvious. They might be deeply embedded in, into value chains of, for example, the automotive sector or uh, you know, automotive sector and electrification of the automotive sector. And so I guess the question there might be, are these types of uh, not so obvious but incredibly critical components sort of uh, identified by, by the uh, uh, by the, the taxonomy. I think a 
also has some concern about uh, political pressure and lobbying uh, because of the sort of processes, the political processes around uh, uh, around uh, the taxonomy and and frankly the significance of it all. Uh, it probably will uh, induce some some uh, of that type of uh, activities as well. And what does that mean for the credibility and the functioning of a taxonomy in that case? And I guess the last thing I would say is that. Um, and very much from a practical perspective is that um, the technical uh, criteria of the EU taxonomy today is very, very detailed. Um, and uh, today we do not have, uh, even in European companies, that type of level of product level uh, technical detail and criteria. So there's definitely a big lack of, uh, of data. And um, you know, that obviously is even harder for companies outside of Europe that are not necessarily fully focused on uh, and, and not under the obligations of some of those sustainable reporting obligations that the EU is also putting in place for European companies. Also, I would note that um, quite a few other countries like Canada, Japan, Australia, for example, are establishing their own green taxonomies at the moment. And they are more focused on their local market economies and their specific circumstances and are much more focused on sort of the transition opportunities to lower carbon activities. So I think there might be a risk that it could be quite confusing for international investors with a sort of a future plethora of hugely fragmented definitions and green taxonomies in different countries of the world. It's still very early days, but as often, I think international collaboration and harmonization would be important here to avoid the sort of confusion and avoid having many different taxonomies become uh, perhaps then almost meaningless because of too much fragmentation. So those are a few sort of uh, observations of, around the uh, taxonomy. Yeah, it definitely sounds like there's a few challenges ahead on that. So how do you think the ESG um, investment industry will evolve from here and what are impacts is plans to stay at the forefront of that? Yeah, so I would say there are probably about there are many things going on, but sort of three main trends taking place. And, uh, and these are all things that uh, IMPACTS has been very focused on, on for a longer time already. I, I would say the first one is um, really understanding the real impacts of investments uh, and real impacts, whether they are positive or negative. And I think the focus has been so much on quantitative data, which of course sits very naturally with the investment world. But the the closer we get in our understanding of actual real life impacts that activities have on biodiversity, on water quality or, or availability, or for example, human health, uh, whether they are negative or positive, uh, the less I think you can rely on just one number, uh, but it becomes more of a narrative and perhaps, uh, perhaps a combination of uh, numbers, scenarios and narratives. But I think we can't shy away from that because otherwise we won't get to the bottom of what real life impacts from investment activities look like. And I think the focus on positive solutions and opportunities and impacts will continue uh, uh, also in the future. I think the second really interesting um, development and trend would be the focus on integrating the most material sustainability aspects, both risks and opportunities into financial reporting and valuation models. I think it's been very interesting to note the merger between SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standard Board, and the integrated reporting organizations just this week. I think it's a significant event and a sign of where things are moving. And it's very positive in my view. I sometimes say a bit provocatively that I think sustainability reports should be completely discontinued. But certainly I think those sustainability reports that are more like glossy PR reports are not helping the companies themselves because they mainly come across as you know, potentially green or rainbow washing. And they most certainly aren't uh, investment or stakeholder useful either. So I think ideally material sustainability information really needs to become integrated into annual reports and 10 Ks in the future. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is very much related um, and that is that sort of question, what is materiality and what is sustainability materiality and for whom is it material? So is this about shareholders or also broader stakeholders? 
And I think COVID-19 has really brought the concept of stakeholder capitalism much more to the fore than ever before. And uh, it has also been so clear that actual businesses' success and their value is heavily reliant on, on uh, staff and suppliers and communities and customers uh, being available and being well. So I think this will become increasingly a focus um, that um, while companies that focus mainly on maximizing the value of their shareholders and they can do very well in the short term, our belief is that increasingly, it is increasingly clear that companies that continue to do very well over the long term have excellent relations with all their stakeholders. We always finish the green dream on this question. What is your favorite sustainable drink or snack? That is actually quite a tough one. Uh, it should be easy, but it's quite a tough one. It feels like most drinks or snacks are not particularly sustainable in general, I would say. But I think we can make really, really great food choices that are both uh, tasty and healthy and not that taxing for the environment. And one example I was thinking of was uh, growing up in Finland. And uh, what I think is probably the most specific thing about food over there is that it is actually quite seasonal and people are still, for instance, foraging, uh, you know, berries in the summer and mushrooms in the autumn and fishing for specific species at different times of the year, right? Crayfish late summer or burbot through the holes in frozen lakes in midwinter, etc. So back then in Finland, I definitely didn't think about this as, you know, anything sustainable. But actually, I think this type of uh, seasonal, local approach to food and eating is is just that. And I think we can today in our often quite urban settings achieve some of that um, through the many great box schemes that are in place, because they can really sort of support us in the, you know, having great variation of foods, but also uh, foods that are healthy and local and seasonal. So that would be my answer to, to that question. Fantastic. What a great answer too. Well, thank you very much for joining us on The Green Dream, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me.